I love you. Do any other lesbians from the 90s, the Jurassic era, no pun intended, no the pun was intended, remember this film because what the actual frogs. The sapphic elements in this film are so messed up and yet there's something about Drew Barrymore wearing a leather jacket with a naked lady on it that kind of balances everything out. Growing up in the 90s as a semi-closeted lesbian wasn't easy and I remember re-watching this film over and over again because A, awful sapphic crumbs are better than no sapphic crumbs at all, which is how it was in the 90s, and B, Drew Barrymore. Enough said. She has the face of a cherub. I still love her. If she needs a wife, I also need a wife. So yeah. Hi guys, we're going to do a video and in today's video I'm just going to be reviewing the 1992 film Poison Ivy. As a disclaimer, I think this film is, it's fair to say, a sapphic film, but it is incredibly messed up and it does contain every negative sapphic cinematic trope under the sun. There's also a couple of semi-graphic hetero scenes in there, which I mentioned for my lesbian audience who may not have seen this film. I don't want you going in and having your eyes eyes assaulted because they will be assaulted. It was 1992, they needed the funding. They needed the funding and so they chucked those scenes in. Okay? It's like Tim and Jenny in the L word. Be prepared. Also this video will contain spoilers. You have been warned. If you're not familiar with Poison Ivy, it's about a troubled teenage girl who befriends an introverted high school student, schemes her way into the lives of her wealthy family. But now for some fun facts about this film. Oh. This film is based on an experience that the producer Melissa Goddard had when she was younger. Goddard had a friend stay with her and her family and that friend eventually seduced her stepdad. It's Jerry Springer material through and through. Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. Also Kat Shea, the director and writer of Poison Ivy, always wanted Drew Barrymore specifically for the role of Ivy, but because Drew Barrymore was a bit of a wild child. She kept failing to appear for the auditions for this film so eventually Kat was fed up and contacted her agent and was like I'm no longer interested in giving her this role but the agent was like no please just give her one more chance and so Kat did and Drew ended up auditioning at Kat's home not knowing that Kat had already decided to give her the job right from the beginning anyway. And lastly, Kat Shea said in an interview that she initially wanted the character of Ivy to live, hitchhike away at the end of Poison Ivy, but an executive at New Line felt like the character needed to die for what she'd done. So this film could have had a very different ending from what it did. Those, those are fun facts. So let's get into it. On to the review. Rewatching this film as an adult, I found it was better, but also worse than I remember it. The sapphic re in this film is a lot more overt than I remember it being. It is rife with subtext, which actually bleeds into main text. Like, it's very gay. But it's worse in the sense that Jesus H. Christ, the internalized misogyny and homophobia in this film is um it's off the charts it's it's not good at all even though this film is directed and co-written by a woman it's a frightening example of the negative way that young women were perceived in the early 90s and the way they were consumed on screen it it's really something i mean it's not a picnic now but back in the day my god <laughs> the amount of times that ivy is referred to as a slut in this film alongside all of the close up shots hypersexualizing Drew Barrymore's body. Every other scene is, is just ridiculous. Ridiculous. Even if there's an element of realism about the way that Ivy as a character is perceived and the way that she's referred to 
because of it. Because if we're honest, that was and still is the way that a lot of people perceive and speak about women who dress in a certain way, who are perceived in a certain way and so on. They really were beating the audience over the head with the fact that this young carefree woman with a level of confidence is something to be perceived negatively because of those attributes. Even before she had done anything wrong or crazy. To add to this, Ivy is so clearly nothing more than a vessel for the other character's sexual desires in this film. There's no real depth to her or exploration of her as a human being at all. In fact, Kat Shea said in an interview that Ivy is a cautionary tale and that she's a character who would do anything to get a sense of home and that no one should aspire to be like her. Which I think explains a lot about the surface level writing around Ivy as a character since she wasn't crafted to be a fleshed out individual, she was crafted to be a plot device. That said, Drew Barrymore is so beautiful and ethereal a being, a true Pisces queen, I love her, that it's easy to be engaged with her performance on screen, no matter how bad the writing for her character was. And her devil may care attitude does fit the role she was cast for, it does. But certainly there's a human element missing from the character of Ivy, and any glimpse of humanity or depth that we did get was due to Jew Barrymore's natural warmth as a person. Across the board, I would say the writing in Poison Ivy is both thoughtful and atrocious. It's thoughtful in the way that, on the one hand, they've definitely created a production which encompasses layers and it's 100% a film in which you need to read between the lines and pay attention to the suggestion of what's happening, particularly in terms of the characters. For example, Ivy kills a wounded dog in the beginning of this film and that obviously shows us she has a capacity for brutality. It says a lot about her her as a character, we're made aware that she's a morally questionable person. And it is of course a foreshadowing of the murder of Sylvie's mother. However, there's also the suggestion that both of these killings were mercy killings. The dog was clearly very wounded and in a lot of pain and Ivy put it out of its misery. And you could apply that same notion to Sylvie's mum, which makes Ivy as a character slightly more morally ambiguous as opposed to just black and white evil. Alongside this, Ivy says to Sylvie when they're both sat by a window together, if she were to kill herself, she would like to fall because it would feel like flying and you wouldn't feel the impact upon hitting the ground. Which further reinforces the notion that perhaps she thought she was committing an act of kindness with Sylvie's mum. So in this way, Ivy's actions are not necessarily two-dimensional. However, on the other hand, like I said, she's not fleshed out enough as a character for us to really know what her true intentions are, because most of her time on screen is just her serving as a vessel for Daryl and Sylvie's desires. And on the other hand, the writing is atrocious in the way that a lot of the dialogue between the characters is either stunted or crude. Crude even for the 90s. A lot of the dialogue just felt like they were trying to be edgy or controversial for the sake of it and not in like a cool way, it was like a cringy way. I mean the dialogue between Ivy and Sylvie was so bad in places, the only reason their relationship was believable is because of the chemistry between Drew Barrymore and Sarah Gilbert. Their chemistry pretty much carried this film to be honest, because the writing around them and the dialogue between them sure did not. Sure f***ing didn't. But moving on to the sapphic elements in this film, which are very interesting to look at under a magnifying glass. Sylvie's desire for Ivy is very overt, 
from the get-go, but it's intertwined with a lot of internalized homophobia and internalized misogyny. The film opens up with Sylvie watching Ivy and writing about her in her journal. Sylvie is casting judgment over how much skin Ivy is showing. She clearly has a negative perception of her, but she also notes how beautiful she is specifically her lips. And then she connects her lips to, and I quote, another part of a woman's anatomy, which is quite the thing to be contemplating when watching another woman. And this obviously suggests a sexual attraction, which Sylvie is aware of because she then goes on to state that she might be a lesbian before she dismisses the idea. And this dismissal, or rather denial, is really what the crux of the film is about. So you can see how this resentment stemming from internalized misogyny is intertwined with desire, and it's incredibly interesting. The feelings Ivy and Sylvie have for each other are so obviously romantic, but all throughout the film, it's suppressed and played off as everything else except what it actually is. I thought it was interesting that their close connection was always implied to be a result of Ivy trying to replace the family that she lost, or introverted and awkward Sylvie just trying to find a friend. But you can tell from their interactions all throughout the film, Film, that their connection is so obviously romantically coded, yet Sylvie never wants to acknowledge it for what it actually is. This is most prevalent in the scene where Ivy and Sylvie are sat outside and they're having a bit of back and forth. They do bicker like an old married couple sometimes. It's giving season one Carmilla and Laura the classic antagonistic but lesbian dynamic that we're all familiar with. It is giving Rachel and Quinn. So they're having back and forth and then Sylvie says, don't patronize me. And Ivy responds with, I'm not patronizing you. I'm loving you. And then she goes on to tell her that she loves her and there's a lot of intent behind the way that she says it. And Sylvie awkwardly says it back. You can tell she's a bit unsure before Ivy kisses her on the lips. And it's not a friendship kiss. It's not, but you can see how this affects Sylvie because she's not quite sure how to respond to the kiss. She doesn't pull away, but she does seem a little bit shy and awkward. And I really think this scene is very telling of her still unpacking her true feelings for Ivy. We know she has an attraction to Ivy. That's very obvious all throughout the film. Not just because of the journal scene and the admiring of her body, but also the eagerness she has to impress her and secure some kind of relationship. She is clearly very taken with her from the get-go. Come on. I mean, the way she spends money on her and then when Ivy moves in with her, they're sleeping in a bed together and they have a clear level of intimacy which goes way beyond platonic. They're very couple coded. <laughs> However, as a result of their true feelings not being expressed, particularly on Sylvie's part, there's a lot of underlying tension between them, which has them both visibly frustrated throughout the film. And it's not just romantic tension, there's also a class difference between the two of them, which adds another layer to their relationship. But this does get called out at one point in the film where Ivy brings attention to it. And this is probably the most potent scene in the film, not just because they finally have some kind of actual communication about their feelings, but also because of what's not being said about their relationship. If you pay attention to the eye contact, the chemistry between them and the body language in this scene, all of it expresses the hold that Ivy has over Sylvie emotionally and reveals such a genuine affection between them once they're able to let their walls down. Interestingly, after this scene, they both hitchhike home and Ivy sits up front with a random guy whilst Coop which is Ivy's nickname for Sylvie, and I might use it occasionally in this video, okay? Sits in the back of the truck and watches Ivy through the window. And it seems to me that this scene was purposely shot in a way to portray Sylvie looking at what she wants from the outside. The window represents this unspoken 
barrier between the two of them. And I think this is a barrier that Sylvie herself has erected by being unable to come to terms with the fact that her feelings for Ivy are romantic. And I also felt like this notion was paralleled in the scene of Ivy watching Sylvie play the piano through the window. There was such a longing in both of these scenes and once again it's looking in at what you can't have. It's looking in at what you want but can't get to. It's, it's given sapphic subtext. <laughs> One thing I have to say about this film is that Drew Barrymore and Sarah Gilbert have so much chemistry. I know Drew Barrymore can elicit chemistry with a table, like I, I know that, but it really is there between them. And their chemistry is what carries this film. Their eye contact carried this film. It did. The scenes with Coop and Ivy are so connective and authentic that despite the unhinged elements, their relationship never read to me as Ivy using Sylvie or trying to have some kind of power trip over her. Because you can tell from the very beginning, they just liked each other. It was Sylvie who wanted Ivy to come into her life, not the other way round. And whilst it's obvious that Ivy is very comfortable benefiting from being in Sylvie's life, there really wasn't any need for her to express a romantic interest in order to stay there. So I've always viewed their relationship as a pure but difficult one. And it was difficult because Sylvie was never ready to accept her feelings, her true feelings towards Ivy. And if you compare their relationship to the relationship between Ivy and Daryl, I think there's a stark contrast. Even though Ivy and Daryl's relationship is much more explicitly physical, you can very much tell it's a power trip for Ivy and her seduction of Daryl is absolutely motivated by her wanting to secure a place in the family. If you compare the way that Ivy takes money from Daryl, holding his hand and then snatching it away with a devious glint in her eye, to the way that she hands Sylvie back her money, grabbing Sylvie's hand but refusing to let it go, which then leads to a connective moment between the two of them, we can see how the film contrasts Ivy's intentions between these two relationships. And of course, this is where the film becomes this hybrid of two different narratives and visions. You have the suppressed sapphic love story unfolding alongside the erotic single white female story. And so therefore this film ends up suggesting that romantic love is utilised as a replacement for family love. And this reaches its peak with the ending. In fact, the ending basically solidifies that notion with Sylvie hallucinating and confusing Ivy for her dead mother. Sylvie tells her quote-unquote mum that she loves her and then they kiss. But when the kiss becomes intimate, she realises that it's Ivy and snaps out of it. And I thought this scene was interesting because from Ivy's perspective, Sylvie was finally confessing her love for her and as a result, she kisses her in a way that is very overtly intimate compared to their earlier interactions. And we see how the unspoken barrier between them has finally been broken. But because of the other elements in this film obscuring their relationship, this moment becomes about something else. And of course, Sylvie is rightfully angry with Ivy for the murder of her mother, and shoves her towards the balcony, eventually letting her fall out of it clutching her necklace. And then there's a final shot of Ivy, dead, with Sylvie's necklace in her hand. And of course, the necklace has a lot of significance because it was given to Sylvie by her dad. And Ivy, upon first hearing this, remarks, he must really love you. And in another scene, she's clutching the necklace in bed with Sylvie. And she says, my father never gave me anything real, implying that the necklace is a real token of love and that's what it symbolises in this film. Interestingly, the light from the crystal on the necklace shines across both of their eyes whilst they're looking at each other before Ivy falls to the ground, which was a beautiful artistic choice that connected them in their final moment through the meaning of the necklace. And by the necklace ending up in Ivy's hand at the end, it symbolises that at the core of everything, this film is about the love between them. 
And this is reinforced by Sylvie's voiceover where she says, I still think about her. I guess I still love her. She might have been even more alone than I was. So the film really begins and ends with their relationship and sadly the ending is pretty predictable for the time in which this film was created. The sapphic relationship ending in tragedy, the death of a sapphic character and the death of a sexually active young woman. These are all cinematic tropes that are heavily embedded in the history of cinema and this film was collecting them like Pokemon trading cards, yeah. To be honest, a lot of what I love about this film is just the 90s vibes and aesthetics. Takes me back, takes me back. I would say that some of the drips are lesbian coded, but that is just the 90s. There is an overlap between 90s fashion and lesbian fashion. There, there is. Even the naked lady on the leather jacket. There's just so much nostalgia in Poison Ivy for me and it's such an interesting film in terms of its sapphic elements, even if they are slightly disturbing at times. Overall, Poison Ivy is not necessarily a good film, but it is one close to my heart. My shriveled, blackened heart. And I do enjoy rewatching it, mostly because of nostalgia and Drew Barrymore, that's true, but also because I understand the essence of this film. I can see what it wanted to be but couldn't due to the time in which it was created, and I appreciate it for what it is. And in terms of female and sapphic representation, in the early 90s it's an incredibly interesting film to deconstruct. I love Drew Barrymore. I have loved her forever. Okay guys, if you've seen Poison Ivy, let me know your thoughts on it down in the comments section below. Don't forget to subscribe for instant disappointment and I'll see you guys soon. Bye.